In this film series, we look into five Celtic port towns that are connected and intertwined by the ferry routes that serve them. To get to know the history of these routes, the wonderful wildlife, and the relationships that they continue to nourish, we meet up with Welsh and Irish locals who show us how they're inspired by this fascinating crossing. Welcome to Ports Past and Present, Pembroke Dock to Rosslare Harbour. Bladderack by Greg Howes. Forged from the fire of the Napoleonic Wars, a new harbour was born, red upon the rock for Pembroke, a dock. As the shipyard grew strong, the clevi did throng with boats and beaters of steel. Before 1814, Pembroke Dock was little more than a, a fishing village, a very sleepy fishing village. But after 1814, it became a naval dockyard. Hundreds of ships were built here and it became of national and worldwide significance. One of the historical points in there is these wonderful gun towers we've got behind us. There are a few of them in the haven. In the, uh, in the waterways leading out, and there's another one at Tembe. And uh, they were actually completed midway through the 19th century, or the plans were, were drawn up for them many years before. Uh, I think since the Napoleonic War, we've always had a fear of, of being invaded. By the time that these things were actually finished off in the mid 19th century, the threat from the sea had, had long gone, really. So they became sort of white elephants almost instantly. It does give me a sense of freedom and it makes me feel alive and it's quite nice to just feel completely immersed in the waters of life and it's nice to sometimes see what you're actually swimming with as well. The water around these areas are normally quite clear and you'd be surprised at what you do see in the sea. Weaving our way over the waves we look north to see Milford spreading forth, its wings wide across the haven's dew. As the promise of wide waters beckon, we see St Anne's upon the mount, a legend to reckon, a lighthouse most fair. I've always dreamt of working on a, on a seabird island. This place, its cliffs are full of birds, it's noisy, it's smelly, it's, um, yeah, there's an absolute cacophony, I love it. It's, um, it, yeah, it's the, the largest Manx Shearwater colony in the world. So we've got 40% of the, the world population of Manx Shearwater nest here on Skoma, and, and at night it is just, it is alive with the sound of them. It's, it's an exciting place to be, and I've always, yeah, always sort of dreamt of living on an island, I think I, um, I read, I read too many, too many adventure books when I was a kid, I guess. So if you were crossing on the, on the ferry over to Ireland and passing by, then yeah, you might see some of the, some of the birds that we have nesting here. Um, you also, being that little bit further out, it's, uh, you could potentially see not just common dolphin, but maybe Risso's dolphin, if you were really lucky, um, minky whale potentially, which, uh, which would be pretty cool. Uh, we actually, um, yesterday there was, a, there was a sighting in the area of a humpback whale. Now that would be very unlikely, but, um, but the ferry also passes quite close to, to Grasham. Island and this is the the third largest gannetry in the UK so it's really significant internationally for the northern gannet so hopefully um, people on the ferry will be able to to, to see and, and potentially even to hear the, um, the the birds there and to and to watch them diving which is an incredible sight. Greet the islands where men are no more just ghosts and mists upon the shore. A wild and winged crown. Puffins, gannets and chuffs rise regally from a turquoise gown. Songs of saints and ogham script. 
wrecks and reeves, smugglers and thieves, fishermen and mermaids, tails tall and wide, spun upon a dolphin's hide, bladderack to island and back. <laughs> Sandpapers at Rasslair by Bernard O'Donoghue. The standard procedure is to fill up with petrol just past the long scenic drop down into Dungarvan. To drop the bags at the Rasslair Lodge and drive to the beach behind the ferry port where our boat is all business preparing to set off. Well, over the years I've done fishing and canoeing and sailing and I've hiked along the shore. The sights and the smells I find magnificent. And even on a calm day, the sea can be calm in different ways. And when the sea is wild, it can be really wild. Our patch of sea here is one of the dodgiest patches of sea you'll get anywhere. Between here and Tusker. The waves coming from all sorts of directions, all different directions, and the way they interact with each other. Even mariners, master mariners from far away, remark on how this patch of sea has amazed them. So it's an interesting spot. It will reach Wales and then cross back for us to embark in the morning. As the twilight deepens, the on-off of the Tusker light finds its range. We are watching a stone chat swaying precariously on its perch. There are lots of wading birds along these shores. Red shanks, which are named for their red legs and green shanks, which are named for their green legs. But we also have one called the sandpiper. And uh, the sandpiper, no doubt, is named for his whistle or tune. Now, if you're far out at sea, maybe between Ireland and Wales, you'll see plenty of seabirds, particularly gannets and auks. If you're on a trip on the ship, you're guaranteed to see them. And sometimes seagulls will follow the ships all the way from Wales to Ireland and back again. At the water's edge, a small flock of sandpipers is pattering to and fro, letting us almost catch up, then shrilling off in a sparkling V of flight to settle on a new ridge of sand 50 yards ahead. This is where they live. It's where they will be when we next start out from this same perfect point of departure. When you live by the sea, you can smell it, you can hear it, you can see it. And if you go for a swim in it, you can taste it sometimes. And of course, the sea appeals to all the senses. Lots of people in these parts, when they've been away for maybe only a day, they have to come down to the top of the bank and have a look at the sea as if they fear that the sea might have disappeared when they've been gone. <laughs> yes, I do feel a strong connection to the sea. I always have done, ever since I was a young child. Uh, I've always found it an inspiring place to be, a beautiful place to be. You know, the water holds what is unseen, the unconscious, and the land is very much the conscious. And the strand line, if you like, is like what's left behind by the dream. So you get the flotsam and jetsam, they're neither sort of known or unknown and where they come from. And that's sort of like the debris when you wake up from a dream. That's how I view the strand line. I grew up about as far inland as you could get in Scotland. Uh, so visiting the sea was always, it was always a big deal. I've never lost that love for it. So the fact that here I can, I can see the sun rise over the sea and then I can just go to the other side of the island and see the sun set over the sea, it's, uh, it's absolutely incredible. I love, the, I love all of the wildlife associated with the sea, but I love the sea itself. It's, um, it's 
is an incredibly powerful force. Uh, it kind of it diminishes everything else in contrast. <laughs>